Hello and shalom to everyone. Today I'm going to talk about growth of fintech startups, or to be more accurate, direct to consumer fintech startups, uh, my favorite topic. My name is Shlomi Orgad, I manage the fintech vertical in Facebook Israel, and what we do, what I do, is partner with the most interesting and the most disruptive fintech startups that are out there, and supporting them in their growth journey. Now, it's not only about our experience, I'm also collaborating with my colleagues from all around the world and sharing, we share learnings and best practices. And as you can assume, probably the vast majority of, of the fintech direct-to-consumer startups globally are active on our platform. So today I'll share with you some of these learnings um, based on our knowledge and also the experience of every interesting direct-to-consumer fintech you know. I'll start with a general framework something that we use in Facebook Israel, and then general because it, it implies not only to fintechs, and then I will deep dive into two specific topics which are crucial for fintech companies, again, based on our experience, the targeting and the messaging. In other words, who do you target and what do you tell them? Before we start, before we deep dive, a moment of definition, direct to consumer, I mentioned it before, now, you're all familiar with the B2C and B2B uh, definition. We broke down the B2B into business to small and medium businesses and B2E, businesses targeting large enterprises like banks and insurance companies. The first two ones, B2C and B2SMB, were referred to as direct to consumer because, like the name implies, they target their end consumer directly. The business model has also imp implication on the method of growth. So the more D2C you are, the more larger user base you have. So you are going to use a mass marketing tactic, for example, online marketing. While on the other side, when you target enterprises, um, this, it's more sales driven. So you're more uh, focused on meetings and conventions. Personally, I strongly believe in the direct to consumer business model. Um, I believe those companies have more control of their fate. They are not dependent on a small amount of, uh, of clients. They can enjoy exponential growth. And on top of everything, because you cannot go uh, through a presentation without mentioning COVID-19, those companies proved to be more resilient during the COVID-19 uh, phenomenon. Uh, while the other, uh, the more business to enterprise, the more sales uh, reliant you are, uh, sales in, in terms of uh, in-person meetings and convention, then you're more vulnerable to, uh, to the COVID-19. Now, let's talk a bit about growth. So the most important thing about growth is, well, to adopt a growth mindset. Um, the framework that I mentioned that we use in Facebook, we developed in Facebook, means that you're constantly introducing new hockey sticks while protecting your base. What does, what does it mean? Let's take a look at the life cycle of a company to explain it. <clears throat> so this is the life cycle of a company, actually of any company. You know that, so I'm not going to explain that. Just focus on the growth part. Um, this is where the sales graph looks like a, like a hockey stick. At some point, you are going to reach the end of the, of the growth phase. So you're going to, the growth of the sales is going to be stalling. It's going to be much more difficult to get more sales and you'll be reaching your maturity phase. However, while you might think that you're over here, you might be only the beginning of your growth stage and you can able, and you're able to extend it. How? Simply by understanding that the growth is not linear. It's actually composed of several hockey sticks. So one hockey stick built, built over another. What is hockey stick? I mentioned this, uh, this term quite a few times. So hockey stick is a new growth initiative, which is based on your existing capabilities. We mapped five key strategies. I guarantee you there's probably more, but five key strategies that are the most, or let's call it the best hockey stick or the best growth uh, strategies. Those uh, strategies are relevant to fintechs as well as other companies, other domains. So new geos entering a new geography, uh, targeting new audience, launching a new product, a different pricing mechanism or multi-brand, all, all are great hockey stick. Let's take, for example, uh, entering a new geo. Let's say that you started in the US, like most of the Israeli companies, and then you target, uh, you entered Europe. Now, obviously, when you enter Europe, you are not neglecting US because if you do, then your sales in the US are gonna drop. Hockey sticks are tricky. 
there's always the risk of defocusing and, and abandoning your existing strategy. Now, it's almost needless to say, we still have to maintain the previous hockey stick. I mean, the strategy that we started with. And we call it protecting the base. By the way, I'd like to emphasize here that when I talk about hockey sticks, I'm not talking about a short-term profit strategy. I'm talking about the long-term major strategic move that shaped the company. So you start with one hockey stick, with one major um, product or service that you're launching, and then you are introducing constantly, introducing new ones. And simultaneously, we are protecting the base. Now, similar to the hockey sticks, in Facebook, based on the work that I mentioned with companies all around the world, we mapped five main pillars that we need to work on in order to protect the base. So these are the things that we need, in simple words, to nail. Um, this one helps us maintain a stable and profitable activity. Now, what my team is doing is, is to work on those hockey sticks, with the, uh, hockey sticks and base activities with various fintech companies. And what we discovered is that even though all those five are super important, for fintech, there are two specific ones that you must get right from the start. That would be signals and optimization and creative and funnel. Now, again, it's important to all the companies, but it's especially important for fintech. And why? Because it, uh, it uh, uh, answers the main two challenges of fintech companies, the growth challenges of fintech companies. Obviously, a lot of challenges with fintech. The first one is the targeting. How do you target the right people? And the second one, messaging. What do you tell them? How do you overcome the adoption barriers? So let's start with the first one, with the, the targeting challenge. Now, as we said, we are focused here on disruptive companies, disruptive fintech, introducing new products, new technology, innovative, changing the way people consume financial services. To better understand that, let's imagine a scale of disruption. On the left side, we have the existing product that is using the existing technology. And on the right side, we have new products using new technology. And the best example for that, that I know, allow me to take you back to the beginning of the 19th century, when most of the people used horses. So we're going to put the horse on the left side and we're going to put the cars on the right side. And I, and I obviously refer here to Henry Ford famous quote, if I would have asked my customers what they want, they would have said a faster horse. Faster horse is something that we all know, something people understand, maybe better, improved. However, those people were not able to ask for a car. This is exactly where the scale of disruption correlates with your marketing channels. The more on the right side your product is, the more uh, innovative and disruptive it is, then the more discovery channels, also known as push channels, you should have in your marketing mix. You need to get the user exposed to something they are not actively looking for. Now, if we take this example, this nice example to nowadays, for example, to the insurance market, on the left side, we have the incumbents, let's say State Farm, um, the more disruptive fintechs like Lemonade, which innovate in the home and renter's insurance, would be more to the right. And Voom, for example, who are uh, innovating and, and offering insurance for scooters and drones, would be on the far right. So think about it. Think about yourself, about your company. Are you more of a horse, a faster horse, or a car? So... We are going to expose our users to the new product using push channels, using discovery channels like Facebook and other channels. And now the question is not how to put it in front of the users, it's how to expose the right people. So again, this is something that is important to everyone and especially in fintech. The answer to that question lies in signals. So like the title says, signals are the new targeting. This is the best way to leverage Facebook AI and the big data to reach the right users. In fact, our systems rely on machine learning that takes into account a vast amount of online signals. What do I mean by signals? Let's take an example. So the, us the user interacts with the content on, your, on their device. Signal could be anything they do on your website. So it could be a reading content, registering for something, starting a trial, or making a purchase. Every time they do something like that, you can report it back to Facebook via a Pixel, SDK, a conversion API, which is also known as server-to-server. -server. So you just send the signal back to Facebook saying, 
this user did that. Our machine learning identifies patterns, learning from the signals, and then matches the content, your ads, to the right people at the right time. Now, a few years ago, if you would ask a digital marketer, what is Facebook's superpower? They probably would said targeting. Now, that was true back then, and it's true today. However, the way to do targeting is completely different. I would argue that signals is our superpower to the, uh, now. Now, don't mistake, this is a major, major change in our approach. Like one CEO told me when, when we discussed this, it's a paradigm shift. And soon, we'll see how this powerful shift, how powerful it can be. So, let's take an example. This is a typical fintech, uh, direct-to-consumer fintech funnel, starting with visiting the website, registering, then doing some sort of a KYC or answering question to get a quote. So onboarding question one, two, and, and so on. You finish the onboarding, you get a quote, and then you make the purchase. Now, naturally with fintechs, in many cases, the, the journey doesn't end in purchase and, and we still have events after that. It's not e-com, but for the sake of discussion, let's focus on this funnel. Now, each one of the funnel steps can and should be mapped into signals that feed Facebook's algorithm. And, and the, the goal is just to feed the algorithm in order to be able, for the algorithm, to be able to target the right people that you are looking for. Think about your own funnel. What steps do you have in it? And what would you like to send back to Facebook? Now, when I say coverage, I mean mapping all your funnel stages. When I say target the right people, who are the right people for FinTech? Now, the answer is usually it's, it's, it's quite simple. You say, okay, I want the users that make a purchase. Maybe in some cases it's the one that make a purchase and, and don't file a claim after that or repay back the, the loan. But essentially it's, the people that do specific specific action. However, we have a trade-off here. Why? Because let's take, for example, two events, two signals that you can optimize for. And when I say optimize for, I mean, tell the Facebook algorithm, bring me more of those. So you can optimize towards registration and you can optimize towards purchase. Now, obviously I would like the algorithm to bring me more purchases. I'm not interested in registrations. I'm interested in the purchases. However, when we optimize the registration, it's more up funnel. So we're gonna have high signal volume. However, it's going to be low quality. Low quality in the sense that not every registration is going to turn into a purchase. So I'm not interested in registration, I'm interested in purchase. So let's optimize towards purchase. In that case, we're gonna have low volume, however, high quality because a purchase is a purchase and money in the bank. So ideally I would like to optimize to purchase However, the algorithm might not have enough signals to get a statistically significant result and then target the right, the right people. So what we do, and the reason that I mentioned before that we should map the whole customer journey, is start testing different signals along the way. Maybe if we optimize to users who completed onboarding question number one or onboarding question number five, we're going to have better results because it's all about balancing the quality and the quantity. Now, this is crucial and very significant. Let me show you a real life example. The client is looking to get purchases naturally. However, this event is scarce. We don't have enough event of it. So as a rule of thumb, our algorithm needs 50 events per week per ad set in order to, to work properly. So we don't have enough purchases. Each column that you see represents a different event, different signal that we optimize towards. The gray balls represent the cost per purchase. In all the cases, it represents the cost per purchase. So for example, we see that when we have a, when we optimize our registration, we have a specific cost per purchase. And when we optimize toward mobile app install, we have a much higher cost per purchase. What you can see here is that, that by changing the event we optimize for, so from registration to onboarding question number four, we managed to bring down the CPA significantly, 57% more. Why? Because step two is more predictive of what we look for. It's more predictive of purchase. So when people reach this stage in the funnel, they are more likely to make a purchase. So if we tell the Facebook algorithm to bring more of those, then eventually we're going to get more purchases and it's going to be more cost effective. Now, 
it's important to note that I changed the names and I, I blocked the, the numbers and I changed the names of the, of the events. However, this is a real life example. So this, it's that powerful. So we reach the right user at the right time. We leverage Facebook AI and big data to get to the right user. However, it's not enough because FinTech is not equal. It's not enough just to get to the user and then show the product. In the case of the e-commerce, just show the shoe or a shirt. With FinTech, it's not that simple. Because with FinTech, there are user adoption barriers. We call them appeal, complexity, and trust. Appeal, most of the financial services, maybe all of them actually, are not appealing. They are not something sexy, not something that you want to do. You do it because you have to, and many times you procrastinate. In addition to that, those services are complex. They, they are not easy to understand. You have to do a lot of reading to understand, to compare alternatives. It's not simple. And the third and probably most, uh, most significant one of those three would be trust. Why would I buy this insurance from you, a new company that I've never heard of, and not from the company that my grandparent uh, used to buy from? So appeal, complexity, and trust, and we like to refer to them as ACT, which are ironically the three main barriers that you need to overcome in order to make the user take action, in order to make the user act and adopt your, your new uh, service. Now, we mapped some strategies, some, some tactics to target each one of those uh, in the creative process. Creative, refer, I refer to the, the ads, the videos or the images that you use to advertise or, on a discovery channel. Now, the act is sort of a framework. So appeal, complexity, trust, you have to take it into account into your product, into your partnerships. I'm going to focus today on the creative uh, impact on, uh, of, uh, of that matter. Um, and some examples. So to tackle appeal, you can focus on building a desired brand to highlight your product and show how sexy it is, uh, to highlight the user motivation, to push them to take action complexity than having a product demo that highlights the simplicity and trust you can use user testimonials you can work with known brands and you can use influencers now there are additional tactics but let's take a look at two real life examples the first one is from itoro and let's first take a look at the at the video and then discuss you think you're too busy to invest online with eToro, you just log in, pick a stock, set an amount, and hit trade. eToro. Now, what they are doing here, in addition to a well-crafted uh, video, is focusing on the complexity, showing how it's not as complicated as you think. It's easier to buy stocks and other assets uh, through eToro. In addition, it's not the only way, but they use a well-known influencer, Alec Baldwin in that case, uh, to increase the trust. I mean, being associated with a well-known public figure never hurts trust. Let's take an example. Let's take a look at another example because not all the companies have the budget to produce a, a video with Alec Baldwin. So let's take a look at Rewire, one of my favorite fintechs in, in Israel. And take a look at that. They, have, they advertise their free MasterCard and they put the logo of MasterCard first day, uh, on, the, on the ad. Now, this is something, this is a quite common tactic. Just go and check the creatives of, of other fintechs to increase the trust by showing that you are collaborating with other fintechs, with other well-known brands. So let's recap everything up until now. Strategy first, platform second. This is what we truly believe in, in Facebook where, when we work with fintech startups. So first we work on the growth strategy and we try to make the pie bigger and not only take a larger share of, uh, of the pie. This is the hockey stick and uh, the hockey stick and base framework. Signals. We saw that signals are the new targeting. So focusing on the right signal, identifying and testing several signals in order to get the best results and get to the right users. And this is the best way to leverage Facebook AI and big data and make them act. So we have three user barriers, appeal, complexity, and trust. Make sure to tackle it in your creatives as well as other, other elements of your company.